Welcome to day two of the ERI Summit and MTO Symposium. Now joining us on the virtual stage, DARPA Microsystems Technology Office Director, Dr. Mark Rosker. The year is 1991 and electronics is suddenly hot. New technologies are being announced almost daily. In April, Intel announces the first low-cost processor for the PC market, the i486SX. In August, the very first website appears, and Linux is introduced. 1991 brings the PowerBook and the first color image scanner. Opportunities in electronics seem boundless, but there are clouds on the horizon. Concerns emerge that American leadership in electronics may be waning. Other nations are competing successfully with the U.S. Fabrication and assembly are increasingly moving offshore. Government investment in electronics research and development, which has driven innovation, is being swamped by commercial investment. How does the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, respond to these serious challenges and opportunities? By creating a new office, the Microelectronics Technology Office, subsequently renamed the Microsystems Technology Office, MTO. Let's pause a minute to consider this bold decision. If you have any familiarity with DARPA, you know that it was, and still is, the premier research and development branch of the Department of Defense. And you probably are aware of DARPA's mission. The genesis of that mission and of DARPA itself dates to the launch of Sputnik in 1957 and a commitment by the United States that from that time forward, it would be the initiator and not the victim of strategic technological surprises. So, why in 1991 would DARPA choose to devote an entire office representing a substantial fraction of the agency's annual budget to the field of microelectronics? How do we connect the DARPA mission to initiate a technological surprise with American leadership in microelectronics? And how does any of that relate to the reason why we are here today, virtually, to discuss the Electronics Resurgence Initiative? Good morning and welcome. Once again, I'm Mark Rosker, the director of DARPA's Microsystems Technology Office. And I want to spend the next few minutes discussing these critical questions with you. The amazing thing is how DARPA leadership had the foresight and the courage in 1991 to recognize how crucial microsystems, and I include here photonics and MEMS in that term, along with electronics, how crucial microsystems would be to the DARPA mission. So how do microsystems relate to strategic technological surprise? Here's an example, something that in government speak is known as C4ISR. Think of C4ISR as the way in which the U.S. military achieves situational awareness, how it sees the world, how it processes what it sees, and how it communicates that information. Seeing what your adversary cannot see is an obvious way to achieve strategic surprise. And the way to make that happen, the very best way, is through microelectronics. For example, by inventing microbolometer-based infrared focal plane arrays that can image the world even on a dark, moonless night. And in fact, that is exactly the technology that MTO helped develop. So DARPA's investment in microelectronics led directly to a new capability to create surprise, helping the U.S. Army own the night. DARPA will, I predict, continue to invest in microsystems exactly as long as the new microsystem technologies that result continue to provide the key discriminators for strategic technological surprise, for C4ISR, and for other strategic areas of interest, like directed energy and electronic warfare. That's our job at MTO. Now, let's fast forward a quarter century. It's the year 2017, another moment of extraordinary vulnerability and change with many important trends, including First, the increased systems reliance on advanced electronics. 
This makes our ability to design, build, and field almost any complex capable system vulnerable. Second, exploding microsystem complexity. As the number of transistors in a circuit has grown from thousands to millions to billions, the time and cost of developing and verifying circuit designs has become intolerable. Third, the movement of advanced fabrication, packaging, and test capabilities offshore. Limited access to the most advanced technologies creates supply chain risk for the Department of Defense and for commercial industry, and it restricts the U.S.'s ability to develop new technologies. And finally, the emergence of hardware security threats. We must now be concerned about threats to our hardware, threats like specter and meltdown attacks, across the entire product lifecycle, from circuit design through deployment and sustainment. These trends all have the potential to be disruptive, leading to strategic technological surprise. DARPA responded to this convergence of threats with some key insights. First, we realized that our adversaries now have access to advanced commercial electronics. Second, we appreciated that our national security cannot be assured without a strong domestic and microelectronics industry. And third, we recognize the many ways in which there has been a convergence of the goals and the concerns of the Department of Defense with that of the United States industrial base. And so to deal with these concerns, the DOD and DARPA established the Electronics Resurgence Initiative. ERI is addressing these trends and opportunities I mentioned through the development of disruptive technologies in the following six key technical areas. One, increasing information processing density and efficiency. This relates to the need to process increasingly more information under sometimes severe size, weight, and power constraints. In many cases, we are motivated by emerging edge applications in which we seek to achieve enormous improvement in the ability to process data at modest power, maybe one watt or even less. In some other cases, such as data centers, we are more focused on large computing, pushing the state of the art in computation. Two, making decisions at the edge faster. This is one step higher. Here, we want not just to process data, but actually to make decisions at the edge. Hardware implementations of machine learning are key. Three, overcoming inherent throughput limits of 2D electronics. Here, we seek to replace the paradigm that electronics are restricted to two-dimensional surfaces or wafers. We recognize that computing now is fundamentally limited by the movement of data and hence by the number of interconnects. By transitioning from 2D to 3D, we can increase the number of interconnects substantially and enable new materials and new architectures, such as those that place memory very close to compute. Four, mitigating the skyrocketing costs of electronics design. Design has become a problem of managing tremendous complexity. Better approaches, design tools, and hardware can help low to modest and even high volume products mitigate their design costs. Five, overcoming security threats across the entire hardware lifecycle. Because the security threats are broad, we are employing a broad strategy to address them through design tools, through inspection techniques, and through supply chain technologies. And finally, six, revolutionizing communications. We recognize that DOD and commercial applications alike are becoming ever more dependent on ubiquitous and secure communication links. So we are developing digital arrays with low power, element level beamforming, and advanced techniques to ensure security. These are the six technical challenges that have defined ERI. It is what we began working on together in 2017. Now it's 2020. At this summit, we want to share with you where we are now in year three of ERI. Many of our ongoing ERI research programs are now entering their most exciting and vital periods. In addition, we continue to start new full programs to address specific topics. And we've started a new way of doing business. We call it Microelectronics Explorations, or MUEs, which allow us to go from topic announcement to kickoff meeting in 90 days. Last summit, we announced the concept, and since then we've already started four of these with more planned. 
Across all six technical areas of focus I've just described, we have achieved a raft of accomplishments. I'd like to share a few. We have developed a deep learning compiler stack that provides a 25% improvement and can speed application development by up to 3x. We have developed a photonic neuromorphic chip to reduce latency in artificial intelligence hardware. We have demonstrated the first integration of photonics into a state-of-the-art FPGA, replacing the electronics I.O. with an advanced photonic transceiver. We have developed autonomous rapid turnaround chip implementation tools. We have demonstrated five entire classes of hardware weaknesses that can be eliminated with minimal overhead on chip power, area, and performance. And we have successfully designed and fabricated millimeter wave digital transceiver and 16 element scalable tile arrays. Beyond communicating these results, we continue at this summit to engage with you in discussions aimed at identifying and addressing promising new areas of future microelectronics investment. This year, we've decided to broaden the discussion a bit and tell you more about ourselves. In the MTO symposium part of the meeting, we will be sharing with you some of the other incredible technologies MTO is developing outside of ERI. These programs leverage and extend the technologies we develop in ERI to best achieve the DARPA mission. Next year, 2021, will be the 30th year since the courageous and inspired decision that the DARPA mission could best be achieved through an office focused on microelectronics research. Why ERI? Because the forces of competition and change demand not just innovation in microelectronics, but a collaboration of government and industry. Why MTO? Because we have a 30-year heritage of leadership in addressing the most compelling microelectronic problems for national defense and for commercial industry. Working together, we will achieve the capability to design, fabricate, and manufacture secure, disruptive microelectronics and micro systems to enable the U.S. to be the initiator and not the victim of strategic technological surprise. Welcome to day two of the ERI Summit. Now joining us is the Executive Leadership Panel, moderated by Mr. Stephen Levy, journalist and editor-at-large at Wired. Well, welcome, everyone. And um, we have uh, a fantastic uh, two-person panel here, uh, the Executive Chair of Raytheon Technologies, Dr. Thomas Kennedy, and Bill Bass, who's the Vice President of Technology at Amazon Web Services. Gentlemen, both of thank you so much for doing this. Thanks well, for thank the time. Thank you for having us. <laughs> So both of your companies have feet planted in both the commercial world and defense. Raytheon has been, you know, in a more traditional sense, um, and Amazon Web Services more recently moved from consumer and B two B to uh, public service and, and public sector and defense. And I'd like to ask each of you how that positions your company to apply innovation, to work in the public sector, and maybe you know, put you in better stead to serve um, you know, defense and, you know, and other public sector clients. Dr. Kennedy, why don't you start? Yeah, let me start off. First of all, the, the new name of the company is Raytheon Technologies. Uh, the company is 50% commercial and 50% defense. And I think the one under the premise that uh, you know, technology can be applied to both the commercial and, and the defense industry and to a certain extent, uh, and this may sound strange, but technology is blind. And, you know, it's blind to whether you're applying it to a commercial problem or you're, you're applying it to a defense problem. And I, I just got two examples uh, of, of that that I, uh, that I think are important for folks to understand on, on how the technology can be applied to both. And the first one is uh, relative to cloud computing. And I know we have our Amazon expert here, so he can, he can jump in on, on his talk to, to help us on that area even more. But this goes to a program that we have. It's called the GPS OCX program. And it's a program to develop the new uh, ground control system for the entire GPS uh, system, both the satellites uh, and the ground stations and all the elements that tie into the GPS system. 
as you can imagine, there's a lot of software development required to go and, and do a job of that size. And in the beginning of the program, uh, due to security reasons, we were limited in what we could do. For example, we were not allowed to use a cloud type computing environment to go develop our software. And we were seeing significant productivity impacts uh, because of that. Well, it turns out that uh, with a, a secure cloud, and it was the Amazon secure cloud that the Air Force uh, had contracted with, we were able to leverage that cloud, secure cloud, and significantly improve the productivity of our software development to, um, to I would call it the highest productivity we've ever achieved in the company. So here's a case where we took something that was adopted and, and well used on a, on a commercial side and brought it across the, uh, I guess, the path of defense and then used that to be, give us a very successful program. And one other example, and the other example is on advanced RF electronics. And this is actually a DARPA program. And it's a DARPA program that was uh, initially started back in about 1983. And it went through to about in the early 1990s. And the DARPA program was to really significantly improve the capability of RF systems and going down to the microelectronics level in the development of uh, mimic chips to support both microwave and, and millimeter wave RF applications. And as part of that, uh, they, 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 we did develop chipsets, uh, gallium arsenide chipsets that we were able to use in new advanced radars and electronic warfare systems and communication systems that you know, you know, provided you know, five to six times improvement in capabilities of, of radars and EW equipment. But that was for the defense side. What it turns out that the high power amplifiers that were developed were also very applicable to the cellular you know, telephone industry. And, and so that essentially was one of the ways that enabled cell phones to be, you know, to be able to the size they are versus these big bricks that they had on satellite phones before. So I just gave you two examples of one side where you know, the technology was used, came from the commercial side and then used onto the defense side, and then the other example was the technology developed under a DARPA program for defense that significantly enhanced the, uh, the commercial side. And then overall, like I mentioned that GPS program. Well, GPS was developed by DARPA for defense applications, and you, can, you know today that's used you know, throughout, the, uh, throughout the world globally to both support the commercial and defense applications. Right. Um, so just a, a, a quick follow up there. You know, does your recent merger, do you think, position you to better serve the, the public sector? Yeah, I think it does because they, we, we achieve scale and it's, it's scale in the, in the solution sets uh, out there that require technology. So all these technology elements, and we'll talk more about that through the, through the course of our panel, all these different types of technologies, again, can be applied to both defense and, and also commercial. So we get this, uh, I would say, an enhancement of what, one investment in technology going into two different, essentially, industries. And, it's, uh, and then we, we believe and we're seeing significant synergies there and, and opportunities to continue to, to expand this technology base for both our commercial and defense businesses. Great. Well, Bill, you've already got a plug uh, <laughs> from, uh, from about AWS here. Um, so tell me about how moving into the d defense, you know, uh, benefits you and how are you able to leverage what you've done previously? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Raytheon's a great partner. We've had a lot of success working with them along with another a number of other defense contractors in this space. And, of course, the Air Force and the military and the intelligence community as well. Uh, all of them are seeking to improve their security, increase their performance, reduce their costs, and accelerate their development with flexibility. Um, we've partnered since uh, 2013 uh, with the IC uh, on developing the cloud and extending it to work in top secret and compartmented environments along with uh, secret environments as well and meeting their security standards. And one of the things we've learned is as we build things for this, what we call ATO level six plus, that's a requirement for defense and intelligence, we roll that into our commercial systems as well. So every commercial system you use on AWS uh, is built to go through this ATO level six plus certification, which is the highest security cer certification that's available in the industry. Um, and that's uh, the equivalent to a common criteria level six plus, we used to call it uh, mm -hmm. back in the day. Um, and we've incorporated that into all of our services. And so as you move these commercial capabilities uh, for the Department of Defense uh, and others, it allows them to leverage high performance computing, you know, IOT systems, tactical edge systems, 
uh, a move from you know leveraging machine learning and a move from sort of temporal analytics to real time analytics, uh, mm-hmm. which you can do in the cloud. You can't really do on prem. You just can't afford to to scale it that way. Uh, you know, and even things like quantum computing become available in the cloud for the defense industry as well. So it's it's a pretty uh, uh, interesting collaboration we have in improving security, scale, and capabilities, and a global reach for them. And uh, even for things like uh, uh, Raytheon, we have a thing called AWS Ground Station, which mm-hmm. is pulling the satellite dishes into our regions for polar orbit satellites and things like that to be able to pull the data directly into the fabric of the cloud as the satellites go overhead. Wow. Um, so Amazon's famous for working backwards from the customer. Yes. Uh, how does that work with Defend? Uh, so we actually, with all our products, including Defense, uh, uh, we we have a, a working backwards process where we talk on average to 53 different customers uh, in defining our products and services. A lot of our innovation comes from our customers. Things actually like Ground Station came from uh, the, a number of Defense customers saying, hey, we shut our data centers down and now we have these dishes that aren't connected to our to our data mm-hmm. centers anymore. Can you just move the dishes into your regions? Uh, mm-hmm. And we kind of said, well, that's an obvious thing to do so we can enable that. Uh, and in addition to that, satellite dishes, the satellites aren't overhead all the time. So it's a nice shared service from that aspect. Or, uh, but also we see things like a lot of the things that required by defense and intelligence, uh, they have to operate in secure environments. They care a lot about security. They're doing life critical systems. They operate in places where there's no network necessarily, rugged environments. Oil companies have those same requirements. Actually, some of the movie studios do for their movie shoots and movie operations for movie entertainment. Healthcare, mm-hmm. financial have the same kind of security requirements and compliance requirements as well. Automotive also. So uh, the things that we build there uh, for the Department of Defense uh, work well in those spaces as well. Now, there's some things we do uniquely for the Department of Defense. For example, uh, our Snowball Tactical Edge product is mm-hmm. also available in a Tempest version. Uh, that's mm-hmm. not something we offer usually on the commercial side. Commercial companies yeah. don't care. Why, why, don't you, why don't you explain what Snowball is? Okay, Snowball, actually, I have a smaller one right here. So you I can just show happen to have one. Oh, great, yeah. I have one, yeah. So, so this is called the Snow Cone. So Snowball uh, Edge is a ruggedized compute device. Uh, it's larger than this. Uh, it's got 5,300 GPUs on it and 52x86 cores, 100 gig networking. Uh, but it also has the same kind of look and feel as this. This is called Snow Cone. This is our lighter weight version. It's designed for drone operations and backpack operations, but they all have triple layer encryption. Uh, they all have layers of anti-tamper. They run a trusted operating system. Uh, uh, they uh, uh, have uh, an e-ink label on the front, which you can see here. So they auto ship themselves and it's integrated with transcon labeling. Uh, they can operate at high temperatures and low temperatures and they operate on unconditioned power and they bring the cloud to the edge in a shippable ruggedized device at a very low cost. And so. This, uh, the normal snowballs uh, under 50 pounds for OSHA standard for one person liftable and all common carriers for, for transit. Uh, and this is under five pounds, so you can actually connect it to a drone and do drone operations with it and then pull it off and ship the data back. Yeah, uh, and it's kind of like a Kindle, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, actually, it, it is a, a paper that the, it's an e ink label uh, that uh, uh, uses the buckyballs just like a regular Kindle does. Uh, mm-hmm. And so we reuse some of our commercial innovation here uh, on this. But this meets all standards for shipping top secret compartmented information uh, uh, in Transcom and also through secret shipping. So mm-hmm. it runs uh, SE Linux, for example. It's got anti-tamper layers. Uh, it does a trusted boot. It attests it's, it, it, you know, uh, goes through a formal methods improvement of all of the security products on it. Uh, it checks its own hardware and software. It's a, it's a pretty uh, amazing little little piece of kit. So we've so security has kind of like peeked into this conversation like three or four times already. Let's like make a head on here. Um, so obviously, it's critical to protect the microelectronic supply chain. It's critical to protect the information. Um, uh, critical for security for manufacturing. Tell me, each of you. You know, what are the, the trends and opportunities that give you confidence that we can do that, 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 that we can be secure in an era of unbelievable challenges to protect our infrastructure and our information? Dr. Kennedy, why don't you start? Yeah, let me start off. And I, I think the, you know, the world has definitely changed here. And, and 
And as a defense contractor, uh, we, we have been attacked by nation states, uh, criminal activities, uh, hacktivists, and uh, also have had our share of uh, potential insider threats, which are employees, rogue employees, or employees that have pure cyber hygiene. So it is, it is definitely, the threat is definitely real. And the question is, what are you, like you said, what do you do about it? Well, what we're doing about it is in all of our solutions that we have, we ensure that we design them for cybersecurity uh, using techniques like anti-tamper and uh, for on the hardware elements and then on the software elements using uh, cybersecurity techniques. And, uh, but we do, we, we do assume that the, a threat will get inside. And uh, but, so we, just, we, we really work also hard to keep that threat from being able to take any of our IP out outside the area. So we work on our IT systems, uh, as you would expect, but we also work on our OT systems, which includes our factories uh, and our other infrastructure. And then we also obviously ensure that our solutions are cyber secure. Nobody wants a Tomahawk missile to do a 180 degree uh, turn uh, that was not commanded properly. So mm -hmm. it's, it's important that, that we provide these cyber secure systems. Now, on the commercial side, we do a lot of work in, on cockpits and likewise, and so we also want to make sure that that's cyber secure. But it all starts up front in the design, you know, having the design requirements established and, and putting in the right structures and architectures to be cyber resilient. And then on a the hardware element to make sure you have the anti-tamper in there so you, you understand what the pedigree is of the uh, material you're using to build your system. Mm -hmm. Bill, what a, you know, um, I know, you know, I guess a one big thread we've referred to before is how Amazon convinced the pretty skeptical um, defense establishment to go outside for cloud yeah. security things. You know, talk, talk a little bit about that and what, you, what you're doing from there. Yeah, as I mentioned before, uh, we go through this certification process with the intelligence agencies for TSSCI Level 6 Plus, which involves uh, a defense in depth system of multi layers of different types of encryption and multi layers of different type of security, along with code evaluation and pen tests and hardware evaluation as well. We also control our complete supply chain. So we build our own routers and switches and even fab our own chips and things like that. So we control that end to end. We do things like we're implementing quantum safe cryptography to en enable that today on our transport layers. I mentioned some of the in, the encryption layers and security and trusted operating system capabilities we have on our Snowball products. Uh, specifically for the defense industry, we have a high assurance guard called Digital Diode that we operate and is getting certified. Uh, if you're familiar with high assurance guards, we have our Nitro product that uh, makes it virtually impossible for someone administrating a server to have access to the information on that server. Uh, and we log every single access uh, with CloudTrail, with an immutable log, along with all uh, our administrative accesses, and we use the two-person rule inside there. We have things for our IoT products, like Device, device Defender, that protects them mm -hmm. against being used from a valid service attack perspective. We have um, uh, Guard Duty uh, and Shield, which are specific products that are designed to protect you when you're operating in the cloud and sort of implement best practices. Mm -hmm. And then we have a whole list of compliance products as well, which auto audit for you uh, and, and provide that with sort of real time uh, uh, feedback. And, and we used algorithms and machine learning uh, uh, to continue to defend there as well. So it's a, it's a pretty robust portfolio along with the resiliency we build in. Our, all of our availability zones that go into a region or multi-factor uh, access and multi-layer access and then we have the resiliency of three availability zones for each region. Each of those, they have three different segments in them with uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, dedicated uh, uh, independent circuits for communication. Yeah, um, Dr. Kane, I know you were about to add something to that. No, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I well, mean- I just, one, of the, one of the things, Steve, and it was, uh, and you were absolutely correct, the, there was a lot of resistance by the DOD to use uh, you know, cloud computing for uh, you know secure type of applications, and uh, I can tell you that that was it was a game changer again on that GPS OCX program, being able to use the the Amazon Secure Cloud to go develop and and integrate and test the, uh, the software for that major system. As, as but as a, as a traditional defense contractor, you know, uh, was it a, a tough path 
for you folks to go along there and accept that as something that was going to benefit your business? No, rather uh, we saw that was the only way to get the job done. And so we, we, were, we lobbied the, uh, the Air Force to enable us to go use the secure cloud and, uh, and at the highest levels. And uh, they did, and it, uh, it, it, was, it was the right thing to do, and it worked out very well. So I'd like to know each of you, cause to wrap up the security component here, how confident are you going into this? You know, the, kind of you portrayed a pretty nuanced picture of, of, of saying, you know, uh, the continuing challenge. Um, I just like a sense, you know, I'm still thinking about Tomahawk missile you mentioned. Uh, that how, how confident can we be, you know, uh, about, you know, um, our security and, you know, both companies like the two of you, which are, you know, doing, you know, tremendous work to try to protect it um, without 100% you know, guarantee, and, and maybe other companies that aren't as diligent as, as you that sort of get into the ecosystem. Yeah, I, th I think one of the, I think you cannot assume that you can build a wall that nobody can penetrate. And uh, I think once once you get that inside your head that that you, whatever you do, someone will figure out how to penetrate, and then you do you try to then do something about that. I think that's that's the key. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. There's, and, uh, there's uh, something called free and open source software out there that a lot of a lot of commercial companies and to a certain degree defense companies were just using, just taking it down off the web and then using that, uh, not not having the knowledge of other backdoors in there. Did the 12 year old who developed that that they was the code unstructured in a way that is uh, is very easy to find a what they call a zero day threat. A zero day threat. You have folks that are sitting around with your equipment and your software code trying to figure out how to get into it. And then all of a sudden they figure that out. You may not have any defenses against that because you didn't know that vulnerability existed. And now the threat is in. Then what do you do? So there's a whole way of you not to be able to monitor the inside of your network uh, to ensure that if a threat did get in, you know, are they are they are you keeping them from getting access to the, the crown jewels of your system? And so it's becoming a much more sophisticated approach to cybersecurity than we've had in the past, where the initial thing was put a wall up and you would protect yourself. I think folks are understanding that there isn't, a, they will get inside and these bots will become insider threats, and get, get, a, you know, get hold of administrative keys and, and then they start getting access to systems uh, throughout your, uh, your, your uh, infrastructure. So it is, it definitely is, a, definitely is an issue. Um, I can tell you, we work with, it, with our board. Uh, our board uh, gets reports on our, you know, our cybersecurity, on our IT, and our operational systems, the, the factories, for example, they're all automated today. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the concerns is, is that a lot of the manufacturers of the original equipment for these factor, for the factories, they want to be able to do updates on their machines from outside the company. And so now all of a sudden you have you know, folks you know, coming in from original, putting in, you know, code changes onto their hardware that are sitting in your factory. And how do you make sure you have control over that? So that they don't introduce uh, some type of uh, threat into your into your system. So it's a, it's definitely a very complicated the situation. And then I did mention about our solutions that we sell. They also have to be cyber secure. Mm -hmm. And Bill, what, what's your confidence level on on that? Likewise. Well, I, I agree with, very much with Dr. Kennedy here. You have to be constantly vigilant and paranoid. I think the more you can take a human out of the loop on automation, the better off you're going to be. So limiting human access, auditing everything, uh, using machine learning uh, for alarming and, and looking at the, you know, the VPC flow logs and all that continuously. Um, I think, uh, you know, also there's a, a whole management system around this. We have a, a, a weekly meeting every Friday with our CEO where we look at our security posture every Friday. Uh, I, I think that's the best practice to have the CEO level involvement at that. I've never seen that before in the industry. So Andy Jazzy sits down and goes over any security issues that might be upcoming or patches we're going to apply or anything that may have happened. And we continue to have that vigilance there. You have to have that constant paranoia. Uh, you know, we, we look at everything as a zero trust and, and, and build from there. Um, so you have to be constantly vigilant and constantly updating. I mean, you know, cryptography becomes obsolete over time as things become uh, more powerful. So you have to be upgrading that. Patching is a, a strong thing you have to be doing all the time. Uh, managing human access is something you have mm -hmm. to be handling all the time. Uh, and you have to have, you know, double checks and triple checks everywhere you go. 
It's a lot of work. Uh, it's an ongoing thing. It's a never ending job. Mm-hmm. Now, um, let's talk about um, the, some of the emerging technologies that help you do that. Uh, Bill, you mentioned quantum you know, uh, what, what, what are you folks doing in, in, in that? And you're working with the government on that? Yes, we are. So we have uh, a service we just launched in beta uh, at reInvent this year called Bracket, which is based, the name's based on Dirac's uh, quantum notations for Bracket, if you wonder where that name came mm-hmm. from. Uh, but what we enable there is three different quantum hardwares on AWS, all integrated and secured by AWS and integrated in with your billing systems as well. So you have the ability to run a quantum simulator first, uh, check out your quantum circuits on the simulator, uh, and then run shots on three different types of quantum architecture, an annealer, uh, a, uh, a superconducting you know, uh, electron system, and a, uh, an ion trap system. Uh, and we'll add more different types of technology there for customers as well. And unless people develop and, and, and work on quantum computers today without having to you know, buy and set up a cryogenic system in their data center, they can just have access to it directly on AWS. And then uh, we also implemented uh, uh, in July of last year, uh, quantum safe cryptography to start getting uh, transport layer security uh, pre-positioned for quantum safe cryptography and been working with the, the IC on that along with uh, uh, NIST standards for the two different uh, types of quantum safe cryptography standards that we've put out there. Mm. And we continue to enable that uh, for our customers today. Well, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it used to be that quantum, you know, cryptography, I'm, I'm worrying about, you know, obsolete algorithms we use all, all the time now. Seems so far distant now, but now... It, it's like super real and, and, and soon, isn't it? Well, I think it's still, I, you know, to have enough qubits to break uh, uh, the current uh, uh, cryptography, it's going to take a long time. Uh, but if you think about, I mean, we have this product called Glacier, which lets you store data for like $0.00099 per gigabyte per month. So mm-hmm. you could effectively record network traffic and save it for 10 years. And then 10 years from now, it, when a quantum computer could break it, let's say you could go through and, and learn what was going on 10 years ago. And some of that stuff still be, be pretty, uh, needs to be kept secure. So uh, uh, implementing quantum safe cryptography now is a good idea on your transport layers. Uh, Dr. Kenny, you're talking about emerging technologies. You're involved in, like I know that it, it, it's uh, with, with, with DARPA and, and really interesting tech, uh, Technology autonomy in in you know in California. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, it's a it's a project with Cal Caltech in uh, in California, but it's really a, the the, uh, the whole subject area of autonomy is uh, very applicable to both our defense part of our business and then also on our uh, commercial side, on our defense side of our business. You know, obviously we have missiles; they're autonomous. Uh, they, we have swarming missiles, so there these missiles t- you know talk to each other. And, uh, and take on different roles. Uh, and so they essentially drive their whole solution to go t- take out the appropriate target. And then on our commercial side, we're using autonomy in the cockpit to, number one, is uh, aid, aid the pilot, but eventually get to the point where you can get into commercial aircraft and there's only one pilot, and then eventually there'll be no pilots. Hmm. And so we're all for using autonomy in, in that area. Uh, some of the other technologies that we're using that have cross applications is, uh, is high temperature materials and, and thermal management. And in that area there, for example, the, uh, the hot section of a jet engine is about 3,400 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, so you have to develop very unique materials and unique thermal management tech- technologies, but then they're applicable also to our hypersonics, our hypersonic missiles that we're developing and helping solve that problem on both sides. And then the, the other area, we, and uh, you know, uh, Bill brought it up, was the, the area of machine learning. And we're using machine learning in our in uh, many of our applications. Uh, we have we develop we have these very sophisticated sensors that uh, develop imagery, and we try to find uh, we call it the, the needle in the haystack, and we use uh, machine learning uh, techniques to uh, we train on the machine learning, and then use those techniques to you know be able to do target recognition very accurately and on, on the uh, and then uh, very similar to what you would do on an MRI. And being able to go in and determine on an MRI scan on that image, you know, which which is a cancer cell, which is not a cancer cell, 
So machine learning is becoming a very, very important tool in our in our bag of technologies for both the commercial and the and defense industries. Yeah, um, and I think, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we're also working on autonomy. Uh, we have a, a system called RoboMaker that's specifically built to accelerate the development of drones and autonomous systems with built-in machine learning and uh, computer vision uh, and a full simulation environment that accelerates that development. Mm -hmm. So that's a big focus area for, for us as well. We run about 250,000 robots at Amazon. So uh, we have mm -hmm. some experience with robotics as well. Sure, yeah, well, I mean, from fulfillment centers to to defense, mm -hmm. right? And, um, and also, also vehicles that operate like Scout uh, and have to drive in neighborhoods by themselves and navigate themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, finally, let, let's talk a little bit about, about uh, chip design, you know, and what you in, in infrastructure. That's a, you know, a topic of huge concern of, of late. And maybe each of you can and, uh, address that. You feel that, you know, our uh, national infrastructure is strong enough to, to, to take us in the future there and, and how maybe each of your companies and, and you view that situation. Well, having uh, trusted devices is very important. I think Bill brought that up before about you know trusted networks, and, and uh, but in our case here is you know we 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 take these chips, these microelectronics, and we use them as a, in, in developing our solution sets. So they have to be you know we have to have a thorough understanding and trusted knowledge of each of those parts. And so that brings you back to having trusted foundries, and and if we can't depend on. Uh, the uh, global a global source of these and, and and the integrity of those parts, then it may require us to you know do some of that that work in the, in the United States and and we as a as a company Raytheon as a company has elected to do that in two areas. One is in the area of uh, RF uh, technologies like gallium arsenide and, and and gallium nitride chipsets. So we have our own foundry there. So it's obviously by default a default a trusted foundry. And we also do the same thing in the EOIR domain. We have our own fake focal plane array factory there, so it's 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 a trusted source of, of the that that element of technology that we require to do uh, a lot of the solution sets we have for both the commercial and then also for the defense. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much further that's going to go, but the national defense strategies calling out Russia and China as as pure threats and. We, we hear all the stuff that's going on in China right now, but so there's, there is a concern that are those uh, devices that come from these other other countries, what do they have embedded in them? Somebody put a back door in them? Has, uh, has, is, is there some kind of a, an issue that you're going to have with that part in, in, in three years? And so that's a, that is a concern, and I know both the Department of Defense is taking, is taking that on as a, one of their number one threats. Yeah, I guess taking that, to the, the, that concern to the top of the stack, on one hand, might accelerate our industry. But on the other hand, and, and I'd like to your view on this bill, there's a, a final question. Um, you know, might cut a short in the supply chain. You know, wh wh where do you see that? Uh, so, so, I mean, we, we have strong partnerships with Intel, AMD, and NVIDIA, uh, along with building our own ARM-based processors like the Graviton processor that we just released and our own inference chips for machine learning acceleration and uh, our own security chips like the Nitro product that I mentioned earlier. Um, and we integrate TPMs into those products as well, along with uh, Hossums and other things like that. Um, when we need to do a trusted foundry type development, we partner with folks like uh, uh, Raytheon and others to add that into the product if necessary, if it's a requirement, uh, mm -hmm. just like we do when we add Tempest capabilities to snowballs mm -hmm. and things like that. Uh, but, you know, so it, it certainly is uh, uh, something that we worry about and we control a multi-supplier supply chain. And we build everything from the ground up. We design the chips. We write our own BIOS. We do validation on the hardware, all those kinds of things to make sure that our supply chain is as clean as we can possibly make it. But it, it, it doesn't, uh, 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 you know, it, it's certainly something we, we are very concerned about and focus on a lot. Well, I, I think we can go on and on and on, but our time is up. I want to thank both of you for an amazing session. Um, and, you know, uh, stay safe. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you, Steve, and uh, thank you, Bill. Okay. Yeah, good, good, good talking to both of you. Thank you. All right. This begins the morning break. The plenary session on artificial intelligence, autonomy, and processing will commence at 11.45 a.m. Eastern Time.